Hello, my name is Giselle, and I'm a volunteer here at Set Free. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video. We want to know what special and exciting things God is doing in your life. If there is anything we can do to serve you, to be in prayer about or celebrate with you, email us at hello at setfreecf.com. We pray that you are blessed by this message. Well, go way over to John chapter 14. Let's start there. John chapter 14. And we'll read verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. This is Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, you know, you could, that's a, a terminology you could say, in our family. You're not talking about a structural house. In my Father's house, if you, you know, if you say, well, down me and my house, you're talking about me and my family. So he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And everybody said, well, thank you, Jesus. Amen. What a promise to us. A pastor went to visit an elderly gentleman in his church, and he said, Sir, he said, with all due respect, as many years as you've served God and at the age that you are now, I'm sure that on your mind a lot there must be thoughts of the hereafter. And the old man, Bill, said, Yes, sir. He said, Oftentimes I go upstairs into the bedroom or out into the garage, and I think, Now, what am I hereafter? <laughs> Who else has ever done that? <laughs> but, but, uh, but for real, I've got one simple thought this morning. I'm talking about the hereafter. I'm talking about heaven. This week I was, I was getting my car serviced, and I sat down with the brother there, Ray, and I know who owns the car shop, and, and we started talking about heaven. And, and I, I'm just going to talk about, I, you know, I couldn't get nothing to preach. I wrote up two sermons. They didn't feel right. I've got one. I was going to preach on anoint your shield, and we've been on the anointing lately. I knew it felt like that, but, but I just couldn't get heaven off my mind. And I just want to talk about heaven this morning. I, uh, Jesus said, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I'll come back and get you, that you can go where I'm at. And in that place, there's many mansions. I'm going to tell you all something this morning. Heaven is real. My friend and I were sitting, and we were talking about heaven, and the Holy Ghost came down in his office. His sister there was with us, and we got to, we got to crying a little bit, talking about how good it was to be saved. And before I realized that it come up out of me, it's over in Matthew chapter 25, I said, can you imagine the day when it's finally over, and you step through heaven's pearl gate, and you hear Jesus, to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou now into the joys of the Lord. I come by here to tell you this morning that one day for you, if you'll serve God, if you'll stay up under the blood, you'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I want to tell you, everything that you've pressed through was worth it. And if y'all help me today, please, because I really don't have much to preach, except I want to tell you that heaven is a wonderful place to be. Your Bible says that our life is as a story, that, as a tale that is told. That's how it says it. It says our life is as a tale that is told. My dad's mother, my Holy Ghost grandmama, lived with just a few weeks to be 100 years old. And she was in her late 90s. And I went and sat down with her one day, and I said, Granny, how does it feel? I said, you look back over your life. She said, Steve... Well, she didn't say Steve. She called me Stevie. She said, Stevie, said, my, said, when I look back now, it seems like it was a story. It seems like it was just, I know I did that. I know I, I, know I, I, know I had those children. I know I worked in the mill. She worked in the cotton mill. She was 73. She said, I know I remember walking back and forth to town to go to church. She said, I remember all that. She said, but you know, it just doesn't seem surreal to me now. When I look back at this age, it just seems like it was a story. And I said, well, Granny, what's real to you? She said, heaven. Hallelujah, it's real. Heaven is real. Heaven is real. 
Life is as a story that's told. But after all you've been through one day, church, listen to what I'm telling you. After all you've been through, all those hard places, all the pain that we deal with in our life, somehow we were born and we had to struggle through adolescence and maybe somebody abused you or hurt you or, or just neglected you as an adolescent and you found yourself in those turbulent teenage years and you was half crazy and knew you was half crazy and then you pressed your way all the way through through school, and it was hard, and before you know it, you wound up getting married, and that was a whole different world. Then the next thing you knew, you found yourself getting up in the middle of the night, tending to sick children, and you had decades of raising children, and it was hard, and you worked hard, and you worked all day, and it seemed like sometimes there wasn't nobody there to help you. It was just you against the world, and it was a hard thing, and heaven seemed like it wasn't even real. It was the only thing that was real to you is what you was facing today, and just maybe, just maybe today, some of us here, we find that we're, we're aging and we seem to be slowly losing the grip. We realize we're not half of what we used to be and it's been a long, hard battle. Am I preaching to anybody in here this morning? Y'all help me. It, it, and, and at times we feel like we're strained. We're stretched emotionally. We're pounded on by physical pain. Maybe we've been humbled by our family disarray and dysfunction and things didn't turn out like we thought they was going to turn out. I come by to tell you, hang on. Don't let go. Go. Heaven will be worth it one day. When you see Jesus one day, it'll all be worth it. Amen. Over in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Over in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. John exiled to the Isle of Patmos. They tried to burn old John in a pot of oil. They couldn't burn him, so they stuck him out on a rock island. I don't tell you... See, the devil can't kill you to God's do with you. John had to write the book of the Revelation. They tried to kill him, but John had something else to do. God said, I'm not finished with you. They put him out on, on the Isle of Patmos. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one set on the throne. John, through the Spirit of God, peered into the paradise of God. John saw some things with his eyes that nobody else has ever seen. And if John was here today, John would tell you, heaven is not a dream. Heaven is not a figment of your imagination. The theory of heaven is not just something that you tell somebody on their deathbed to try to cheer them up and give them a false hope. But I want to tell you something. Heaven is real. It's a real place. It's a real planet. There's a real city. It's out there in the galaxy. And one day you and I will get to go there if we continue to serve God. Paul said it this way. He said you can't even perceive it. He said, it's not entered into the heart of man, neither have we seen or heard the things which God hath prepared for them who love Him. He's prepared things for you that you can't even perceive. It, it, then He said, but He'll reveal them to us by the Spirit of God. It takes the Spirit of God just to give you a little glimpse, just a little peace. I'm telling you, there are things in your future in heaven that you can't even get your mind wrapped around now. God has got such good things for you. If you'll hang on, if you'll serve Him... It, Another place Paul said, I knew a man speaking of himself, said he's caught up into the third heaven and he heard things uttered which were unlawful to speak. And that's not a good translation. In the Greek he said, I heard things uttered that, that it was impossible for me to repeat them. He heard conversation in heaven that was so far beyond our grasp who we are, what we can perceive. He said, I, I, I couldn't even enter into the conversation. I just stood and listened. I was in heaven and things were being said and they was worshiping at such a level I couldn't even get up to that level to worship. I, 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 it's impossible for me to utter it. If he, I'm going to be through quick today. Y'all help me. If heaven is not real, then this Bible is a lie. Come on. Right. Come on. That's right. If heaven is not real, then this Bible is a lie. And your Bible says this plainly. Your Bible says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven. From heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. 
caught up, snatched up, grabbed up, caught up, raptured up. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, them dead relatives you got, and in the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And so shall we ever be with Him. I want to tell you something. Then the next verse says, look what the next verse says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Wherefore, exhort, my Bible says in the margin, exhort one another with these words. I'm going to tell you, the devil wants us to forget about it. The devil don't want it preached. And in most churches today, they're preaching on prosperity. They're preaching on strongholds. They're preaching on deliverance. They're preaching on all kind of stuff. But they ain't much talk about heaven anymore. But my Bible says that one day the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together because the Lord's going to come out of heaven with a trumpet and He's going to take us back to Himself, back to that place where He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come back and I'll receive you unto Myself again. I want to tell you, don't ever lose sight of what's happening. It's not about what's going on here. It's about what's going to be over there. It's not about what I'm living life through right now. It's about one day, one bright morning, one resurrection day. The trump of God's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together. And I come by to do what the Bible says. Comfort one another with these words. I want to tell you, I want to put it back on the table. I want the devil to remember. Remember, we haven't lost our focus with our trouble. We hadn't got caught in life and not know where we're going. We remember that there's a heaven to be gained. We remember that we were saved from a hell. We remember that we were on our way to hell. But now we've got a mansion in another place waiting on us to come and take up residence. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen to this, listen to this. Please understand what I'm trying to tell you. Keep your mind, don't let it get, keep your mind on heaven while you're just a pilgrim here on this earth. Keep your mind, listen, 1,865 times, 1,865 times heaven is mentioned in the Old Testament. 316 times heaven is mentioned in the New Testament. If heaven is mentioned that many times, don't you think we might ought to shout about it? We ought to sing about it. We ought to testify about it. We ought to have it on our mind. Over 2,000 times heaven is mentioned in this Bible. Maybe we need to keep it forefront in our mind. Maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to be happy. First Peter said this way. First Peter 1 4 said, We've been begotten to a lively hope, to an inheritance reserved in heaven, wherein ye greatly rejoice. I won't tell you, you can't take my joy away from me. I want to remind the devil that I know I won't forget heaven. I got an inheritance that's reserved in heaven. I got something I'm going to inherit that's reserved in heaven and I greatly rejoice in it. If life's going bad, everything's wrong, everybody's against me, if I can't think of nothing to give God some praise over, I can just break down and say, well, God, I got something in heaven reserved for me. I got reservations and I'm just going to rejoice in the fact that I've got... And sometimes you just need to tell the devil when he's up on your back, listen, I have not forgot. I know this ain't deep today, but I just want to talk to you about heaven. I have not forgot what the whole plan is about. I remember, Mr. Devil, that Jesus came and died on a cross. And I remember that He shed His blood for me, an old sinner. When I couldn't save myself, He saved me. And I remember your boys, devil, took Him out and buried Him in a grave and put a big stone over the door of that grave. But I want to tell you, Mr. The devil, he went down the hell, spoiled principalities and power, and made a show out of it. Remember that party he had with you, devil, when he got down in the hell? And I want to tell you something else. I'm thankful that on the third day, Mr. Devil, he got up out the grave, took captivity captive, led us with him. And I'm here to tell you today, I'm not going to forget heaven. I remember an old song that the saints used to sing. I was, when I was a little kid, my grandparents took me to the big church of God down there, which they helped establish in Anderson. And I remember that sing that old song. I'm try, I wrote the words down so I could try to remember. It says, uh, I'm feeling mighty fine. I got heaven on my mind. When you get the blues, when you get depressed, get heaven on your mind. 
Get it on your mind. Go around saying, I'm feeling fine. I got heaven on my mind. I feel okay today because I'm going toward heaven's way. I'm feeling fine. I got heaven on my mind. You, can't, you don't have a right to get depressed. They say, if you could travel at the speed of light, that you would get to the planet Mercury, which is 57 million miles away. At the speed of light, you could get there in four and a half minutes. You could get to uh, Jupiter, which is 390 million miles away. It would take you at the speed of light 35 minutes to get to Jupiter. 390 million miles. Saturn is 793 mile, 93 million miles away. And it would take you one hour and ten minutes to get to Saturn. But Paul said, I'd rather be absent from the body and present. We ain't even fooling with the speed of light. We absent from the body and present with the Lord. John said, I heard a voice said, come up hither. And immediately I was in his presence. I, I, I come by to tell you, and it's going to be like this in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We ain't got to make no long journey from here to there. We ain't got to hope we don't lose our way in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. Don't you ever in your life lose that hope. This thing that we do called serving God is for a purpose. It's so I can step up out this old, decaying, aging body one day, and I can be present with the Lord. I have a destination. You have a destination. Destination. Paul said, grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? One day, it ain't going to hurt. One day, it's not going to be painful. One day, it's all going to be over. I come by to tell you, you might have buried your daddy. You might have buried your mama. You might have buried your husband. You might have buried your wife. God forbid, you might have buried one of your kids. But one bright sun morning day, resurrection day, the power of God is going to jerk up dead bodies out of the grave. And there's a voice going to cry, come up hither. Listen to me what your Bible says. Your labor is not in vain. Don't ever forget that. Your labor is not in vain. One day, gee, I got just one message today, and this is it. One day, Jesus is coming back. And we need to get happy over heaven. If anybody ought to be happy, us born again, spirit filled Christians, we ought to be rejoicing. Over heaven. Amen. Amen. I remember I was a kid raised in that little church. That wasn't a little church of God. It was about 1,500 people in the 60s. That was a big church back in the 60s. Big church now. But, but I remember being in that church of God down in Anderson. And them old ladies, they had, you know, y'all remember the church of God ladies had them beehives? How many can remember the beehives? Yeah. Some of you Baptists don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry for you. If you was raised in Pentecost, you understood beehives. They had them, didn't they? The ugliest hairdo a woman could wear. You see one, you think, why would a woman want to? And if you had one, no offense to you, but it was ugly. <laughs> but I remember there were certain songs that they would sing. And heaven would come down. They probably had, what, Dad, 100, 200 people in that choir? It was a big choir. It was a big choir. How many people was in that choir, would you say? You don't know, do you? you, know, you... And they would get to singing, and heaven would come down. This one old lady, her name was Bobby Jean. You probably know her, Mark. Bobby Jean. She, she weighed about 400 pounds, bless her heart. And she would step up, and she would sing, My God is real. For I can feel him down in my soul. And them old ladies would get to thinking about God, get to thinking about heaven. And then somebody would sing. I see, what was that old song? I wrote it down. Let me think. Let me think. I, I, I thought about a song in particular that they would sing. Somebody would sing, uh, When we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Amen. See Jesus will sing and shout the victory. And about that time, 
when they said when we see Jesus and we'll sing and shout the victory, every beehive in the house was going to get messed up. <laughs> Them old ladies were talking. Woo! And it, and it would come down, you know. I'm just telling you what my childhood was like. And you better watch out because they had bobby pins in their hair. When I'd get to shout like that, then bobby pins, that'd stick in the sheetrock if you wasn't careful. You had to make sure one didn't get in your eye, right? I mean, they'd carry on. They'd get, whoo! My grandma, I'd be sitting next to her because she made me sit right up next to her and she'd start going. <laughs> How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And some old man that come in with a cane would be up front going, dancing around. But here's what it was about. They hadn't lost their hope. They, uh, most of them folks were poor cotton mill workers. They drove old junky cars to work. They lived in old ratty houses. They had to grow their own vegetables just to get by through the winter to have something to eat. But you couldn't steal their joy from them. You couldn't tell them that they wasn't a better land than a better place. You couldn't tell them that they didn't have a mansion over on the other side. I don't want to forget there's a heaven. I don't want to forget it. I don't want to forget it. I thank God I was raised in a crazy Pentecostal family. I thank God I was... You know, I, I remember when I got up and got in school and I started going around other families, kids, go home with them, spend the weekend and stuff. And they was church. Maybe they'd go to church somewhere. And I'd go to church with them. And I would sit in church and I'd think... This is weird. I would think their church was weird. Because in my mind, there ain't no Holy Ghost moving in here. Ain't no beehives falling. Ain't nobody running. Ain't nobody speaking in tongues. This is weird. Well, boy, I'm so thankful I was raised in Pentecost. How many of y'all are thankful you're in Pentecost? Yeah. Listen to this scripture right here. I was thinking about something. I was thinking about how, it, how churches used to be. This is going to sound critical, what I'm about to say. I was thinking about how churches used to be and how we are today. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, I want you to read this. If I can get to it in my Bible. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 2 says... Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Somebody said, hallelujah. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Now, that next verse says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as He is pure. You know how I can look in the church world today and I can tell it's not real in people's lives? Because if you, if you think Jesus is coming, if you think there's a heaven, it purifies you. If you don't think Jesus is about to come and heaven ain't even real to you, you'll live any kind of way. You start arguing about not whether it's a sin, but how much can you drink. You start arguing not about whether it is a sin, but how much of that can I do? And, and you get to talking a whole lot about grace. Because people that don't believe in Jesus is about to come love to live up under grace all the time. And I believe in grace. Don't take me wrong. I believe that that's a real message. I believe in grace. I believe in grace. But I'll tell you something. If you believe Jesus is about to come, if you believe there's a heaven, you ain't going to just live anyway with no standards, no conviction about your life, no holiness in your life. But if you really believe that there's a heaven and that heaven is real to you, you're going to pull your sanctified strap boots up and you're going to sanctify yourself. Let me say that word again. You're going to try to live sanctified. You're going to try to live holy. You, you're not perfect, but you're at least going to try to quit doing some of that junk you know sends you to hell. And you're going to pull yourself up and you're going to try to do something. Somebody that believes in heaven, it purifies them. If you think 
think you're going to go there, you tell yourself, I can't be doing some of this stuff. I got to keep heaven real. I got, I got to keep the rapture real in my life. It might happen. Amen. There's an old song. Y'all have heard it. I can only imagine. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or will I in awe of you just be still? Will I stand in your presence or on my knees shall I fall? Will I sing hallelujah or will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Can you imagine your first day there? You need to. It's coming at you fast. And you know, it must torment the devil. He must hate us when he realizes that we've got a home where he got kicked out of. Think about that. We've got a home where we got kicked out of. If you would for just a minute. My message is not deep today, and I realize that. But I hope I can encourage you. Imagine for just a moment your first day in heaven. Suddenly, as this big blue earth fades behind you, and you pass through the Milky Way, and off in the distance you see that beautiful city. And as you get close, you can hear singing and worship. Angels coming in and out of a pearl gate. And you step down inside that pearl gate. And your feet are on a street of solid gold. And out the middle of it runs the river of life. And you look around, and it's the most beautiful place you've ever seen. There's palm trees, immaculate oak trees, beautiful maple trees, trees that you've never seen. There's rivers and streams running everywhere. There's mountains off and off and off and higher and higher, up to 1,500 miles high, upon which sets the throne of God. There's waterfalls everywhere. It's beautiful. On every hillside, there's mansions. There's green parks, massive green parks, full of flowers, full of music, full of people gathering and fellowshipping and being with each other. And, and when you step through that gate, lo and behold, there is your friends. There is your family. There is your family that died years ago and there's the people you went to church with that died before you and they run to you at the gate they're there to meet you they're your welcoming committee and you you hug and you kiss and you laugh and you cry and you walk together and you hold hands and you're in a beautiful place and all of you now all of you have perfect bodies nobody's old nobody's sick everybody's perfect there's no sickness Nobody's in pain. You're laughing. You're playing. You're talking. You're singing. You're reminiscing. You're hugging each other. Somebody walks up to you you never knew. And he says, hey, I want to thank you. I live down the street from you. And I wasn't saved. And every Sunday I'd see you load your family into the car and drive to that church down at the end of the street. And I never did meet you, and I never knew anything about you. But you put a mark on me. And after you moved off out of the neighborhood that next year, I got desperate, and I, I thought about how you live, and I went to that little church down the street, and I walked in, and I got saved. And I'm here today in heaven because of what you did. And you'll rejoice with that brother you never seen, never knew you had any influence over. Some, some lady will walk up to you maybe and say, Listen, I don't know if you remember me. I was a little four-year-old child, and you taught Sunday school one Sunday. And, and, and at the end of the service, you gave us a time to pray to get saved. And I didn't tell nobody that day, but in my heart I prayed and I got saved. And of course, we moved off and I've never seen you again, but I'm here today because of what you did. I just want to thank you. And people after people will gather up around you. Family members will gather up around you in the middle of this beautiful place and tell you what your life was and how you influenced them and how much they're grateful for you. And then you'll hear somebody coming and the crowd will kind of fan back and there will be Jesus. He'll stretch out. He'll stretch out those nail scar hands. I'm not ready here. He'll stretch out those nail scar hands. And here's what He'll say to you. You want to know what He'll say to you? He'll say with a big smile on His face. 
Welcome home. Welcome home. And he'll say, you finished your course. You fought your last fight. Then you'll hear him. You have now entered into the joys of the Lord. But that's our hope. That's our hope. I can tell you, I told you just a little bit about what's there. I can tell you what's not going to be there. Let me tell you what's not in heaven. There's no funeral homes in heaven. Because the upper taker done put the undertaker out of business up in heaven. There'll be no hospitals. All oh, y'all listen to me. There'll be no cancer wards. Hold up, Aaron. There'll be no cancer wards. There'll be no coronary care units. There'll be no mental hospitals. There'll be no divorce courts. There, uh, listen to me. There'll be no bankruptcy courts. There'll be no addiction centers. There'll be no pain clinics. There'll be no teen suicides. There won't be any drug problems. There won't be any gangs. There won't be any shootings up in heaven. There won't be any terrorism up in heaven. They won't, God Almighty, be any racism. Up in heaven, won't be no prejudice, won't be any injustices, won't be any misunderstandings, won't nobody be speaking harsh words up in heaven, nobody have hurt feelings, won't be any arguments. Up in heaven, there'll be no gossip. There'll be no worry. There'll be no depression. There'll be no child abuse. There'll be no war. There'll be no emotional breakdowns. There'll be no murder. There'll be no tears. There'll be no trials and tests. There'll be no trauma. There'll be no temptation. Won't nobody be wearing a heart monitor. Won't nobody be going by the dialysis center. Won't be any wheelchairs. There'll never be an accident in heaven. Nobody have any bad habits. Won't be one locked door up in heaven because there won't be a thief in heaven. There'll be no sin. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no separation. There'll be no starvation. There'll be no tears. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no sickness or death. Nobody will be crying in pain. No rust, no mold, no germs. Heaven never needs a fresh coat of paint. Heaven never needs mopping. Heaven never needs vacuuming. Up in heaven, there'll be no adultery. There'll be no pornography. There'll be no drunkenness. There'll be no cheaters. There'll be no homosexuals. There'll be no pride. There'll be no boasting. It'll just be heaven. I come by to tell you, it's not a fairy tale. I'm going to read you a scripture and I'm going to close with two stories. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. This is our hope. He says this of our future. But you're coming to Mount Zion. That's the mountain that God lives on. That mountain is 1,500 miles high. On that mountain is His throne. On that mountain is a crystal throne room floor as large as an ocean. He says, You're coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, Hey, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And unto God the Judge and all the spirits of just men, and unto Jesus the Mediator. An old pastor had spent close to 40 years in a little mountain town up toward Virginia. And he's older now. And he's taken a church back in his hometown just to come in and retire and move back around where most of his family lives. And some young men from the church where he's moving had come up and helped him pack. And all of his furniture was on the truck. The suitcases were all packed. Everything was packed. 
And the young men were there ready to drive his belongings back down. They were bringing their new pastor back into their church. The old man Bill stepped out the front door of that old house one last time. And he stopped. He turned around and he gazed at it. And emotions flooded him. He thought about his children were born in that house. He raised those children in that house. His wife, several years earlier, had passed, laying in the bed in that house. He thought about the times in prayer and the anointing of the Spirit of God that he had experienced in that house. And he was just froze for a moment, staring there looking at it. And one of those young boys that was with him realized what was happening. He laid his hand on his shoulder and he said, Come on, Pastor. Your new house is a lot better than this one. Your new house is a lot better than this one. The world we're going into is a lot better than, come on, son, is a lot better than this one. A couple had been married 60 plus years. And in the last two years, the wife had contracted bone cancer. This is a true story. And if you've ever known anybody with bone cancer, they, my granddaddy died with bone cancer. There's no relief from the pain. It's terrible. It's horrific. And he was by her bedside in the hospital, and she was dying. And she was in much pain, and it was her last few moments. And he looked up, Bill, and a tear from the pain came out her eye and ran down her cheek. The old man wiped it off her cheek. He leaned over and he said, That's your last one. That's your last one. Because where we're going, God Himself will wipe away every tear. We've got too much to gain. To not serve God. We've got too much goodness ahead of us to not be serious about it. And you know, the sad part is there may be somebody on the sound of my voice, and you're not sure. Let me tell you, heaven is real. Listen to me. If heaven is real, and if all that goodness is, of God is there for you, and you don't want to miss it, God loves you that much. But as sure as heaven is real, listen to what I'm saying. As sure as heaven is real, hell is real. And all the terror, all the torment. And you know, you can snub your nose at eternity and make fun of us that believe it or put it off. But it doesn't change one thing. Heaven is real and hell is real. And sooner than you think, you'll be in one of them. Because it's appointed unto man wants to die. After death, the judgment. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this thing out. When you put down all of your excuses and all your goofy reasoning, and you get right down to it, if today was the day you went into eternity, how are you with God? Where would you go? Because it's for real. You would go somewhere. You do not go to a grave and it's over. Don't believe that lie. 
And the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Paul said for us Christians, absent from the body, present with the Lord, you go one way or the other. If you would like prayer or to talk with someone, contact us at 864-269-3620 or at hello at setfreecf.com. It is because of your generosity that we are able to expand our reach for the kingdom. So if you are blessed by this ministry and would like to donate or learn more, please visit us at setfreecf.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And we pray that you have a radically blessed week.